It was 11.30 p.m. on a crowded flight from Vancouver to Raleigh, North Carolina. Stephen Petro is tired. He'd been at a conference all week, and he spent most of the flight working. So as we approached Raleigh, I closed down my laptop. I read a little bit from a book. I had, um, I had a couple of glasses of wine, and um, then we landed. It was, it was just about midnight. I got up. I got my bag down from the overhead bin. And I was turning to start to go out, and this fellow came up to me from behind and said, aren't you a journalist? The answer is yes. Stephen is a journalist who writes about digital life. And I looked at him and I thought, I don't know you. I don't know why you're asking me that question. I decided I was going to be a little bit rude and uh, not engage with him. I was tired. But then he said, I know you were writing about Apple and the FBI. And then I was like, How could he know that? There was no way he could know that. He said, you better wait for me by the gate. Stephen was totally shaken. He's just spent his flight working on a story about the FBI pressuring Apple to help it break into an alleged mass shooter's phone. This was big news about a year ago. And now the suspicious man wants to talk to him. Stephen felt like he had no choice but to meet him after the flight. I walked out and he came right up to me. Then, sort of joyously, he tells me that he had hacked into the airline system and had been sort of reading around people's um, emails and computers to see what was interesting, what he could find. And mine was the most interesting to him. Not only did he repeat back to me verbatim some of the emails that I had sent and received, he raised other possibilities for me that perhaps, what if I had been corresponding um, you know, with my doctor about sensitive medical matters or transmitting important financial documents. And by this point, you know, it kind of went on for a couple of minutes. Everyone else from the flight was gone. And we are standing at the end of this terminal. I'm here alone with this guy who knew my name. He knew where I lived. The sense of vulnerability and, and violation and, and fear was, was, was high. It turns out the guy who had broken into Stephen's email was a hacker, and his intent wasn't malicious. He was mostly trying to teach Stephen a lesson about living and working in the cloud. A lesson many of us know in theory, but on a day-to-day basis is easy to forget. We're all vulnerable all the time, even a journalist who writes about tech. Stephen hasn't had any contact with the hacker since then, but that sense of vulnerability and that lesson he learned about the cloud has stuck with him. If it can happen here, it can happen anywhere, anytime. I'm Christina Quinn, and this is Dot Future, a branded podcast from Microsoft and Gimlet Creative about making the future happen. Because the future doesn't just happen, it's the result of a series of choices that we're making right now. You can wait for the future to come to you, or you can engage with it and get ahead of the curve. Welcome to Dot Future. It's easy to feel vulnerable to hacking when everything is connected. Your home thermostat, your baby monitor, your car, and if you're Vice President Dick Cheney, your pacemaker. When Dick Cheney was vice president, they disconnected the wireless in his pacemaker so that an adversary couldn't, you know, jumpstart his heart at an inappropriate moment. This is Scott Charney, a security expert at Microsoft. We'll hear from him in a bit, but the point he's making here is that if it's connected, it can be hacked. But this isn't just a problem for regular people. It's a problem on the world stage. This happens a lot these days. We saw it in May with the WannaCry attack. And as we were putting the finishing touches on this episode, another massive ransomware attack hit infrastructure in something like 150 countries. Companies from the Danish shipping giant Maersk to the Russian oil conglomerate Rosneft were affected. And the Ukrainian government was hit hard. Everything from banks to the safety systems at Chernobyl were targeted. It drives the point home. It's more important than ever that the cloud stays safe and secure for all. And that's what we're going to talk about today. New ways of waging war require new ways of waging peace. To keep the cloud safe for everyone. When you hear about, like, the cloud and you're like, well, what does a cloud mean? And it's like, it just means the internet. This is Saruz Farivar. He writes for the tech website Ars Technica. And he's mostly right about the cloud. If you're listening to this podcast on your phone, it's coming to you over the cloud. If you stream movies, they're coming from the cloud. And if you upload your snapshots to a photo service, that's the cloud. 
All of that data lives in privately owned data storage centers around the world. All the big tech companies have them. Google, Amazon, Microsoft has one called Azure. The cloud has a lot of advantages. You can scale your storage so you don't have to keep buying new hard drives. Someone with a lot more expertise than you is busy keeping your data safe. And you can access stuff remotely and collaborate with people who aren't in the room. Problem is, other people can also access your stuff remotely. That's a lesson Stephen Petro learned at the beginning of the show. And it's a lesson that the entire nation of Estonia learned a decade ago. Estonia is a tiny little country uh, at the northeastern corner of Europe. The entire population of Estonia is 1.3 million people. So to put that in perspective, that is the combination of the population of the cities of San Francisco, Berkeley, and Oakland, where I live. In the mid-2000s, Sarus traveled to Estonia to research a part of the book he was working on called The Internet of Everywhere. And I was really surprised that this country that is kind of obscure uh, had somehow decided to declare internet access as a human right in the kind of early 2000s when Wi-Fi was still getting very much getting going in the U.S. Um, Estonia sort of was adopting it all over the place. It was surprising to Sarus. This tiny country had Wi-Fi in gas stations and supermarkets. Their citizens can vote online and they can do their taxes online in about 10 minutes. The Estonian government actually has a name for it. They call themselves E-Estonia. So what's going on over there? It turns out it's all deliberate. Estonia is a very young nation. Over the centuries, they've been occupied by a ton of other countries, ending with the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. So now, to Estonia, being connected isn't just about convenience. It's a kind of insurance policy for protecting the identity of their young country. If the territory of Estonia were to be taken away, the government of Estonia, the state of Estonia, the Republic of Estonia would live on in its data, which would reside somewhere else. That somewhere else is the cloud. Estonia hasn't always had its government backed up to the cloud. Early on, when they were still converting from Estonia to e-Estonia, the cloud didn't really exist. And that made Estonia vulnerable to an attack. An attack that all started with a statue. It's 2007. The statue in question is the Bronze Soldier of Tallinn. It's a Soviet soldier located in a central square in Estonia's capital, Tallinn. The statue is about six feet tall. He holds his helmet and wears a cape. He's looking solemnly down toward the ground. And at his feet lay the remains of a dozen Soviet soldiers. The monument is meant to memorialize the Soviet Union soldiers who died after they defeated the Nazis uh, in the Baltics. To many ethnic Russians that, that still live in Estonia today, this is sort of a, it's a statue, it's a monument that symbolizes their bravery and their heroism. But to most ethnic Estonians, the statue was a symbol of oppression. The Soviet Union had been an occupier, and the statue was a relic of that. And then, in late April of 2007, Estonia took the statue down. So at about 4.30 in the morning, some workers encircled the statue, and they put up a huge fence, and there were a lot of people who started getting really upset by this and who started shouting at the workers, uh, shouting things like, shame on Estonia. And there was this large protest that devolved into something of a riot. There were people that were smashing storefront windows. It got pretty hectic. By the end of the night, one person had been killed. There were dozens injured. Hundreds of people got arrested. And then almost as quickly as it had bubbled up, the violence on the street calmed down. But then something kind of weird started happening. Online. First, pro-Russian comments started showing up on Estonian government websites. You know, at the beginning, people thought of this, you know, in the government, they thought of it sort of as kind of a prank. You know, it's kind of annoying, but it's not really harmful in any, like, real meaningful way. But within a week, it was clear. The attack was turning harmful in a very meaningful way. And so May 1st was the day when major cyber attacks began affecting various Estonian websites. There were thousands upon thousands of spam emails that were sent to the mail server of the Estonian parliament, which knocked it out pretty fast. Media websites were attacked in similar ways. Most of the bank websites were not accessible. It was a denial of service attack. Someone was sending so much nonsense traffic to the servers that hosted Estonia's government services that they couldn't keep up. Banks, newspapers, government websites were all knocked offline. 
Even the national emergency number couldn't withstand the attack. And then, after a few days, it just stopped. It would be two years before anyone claimed responsibility for the attack. A Russia-based youth organization called Nashi said they did it. The Kremlin denied involvement, but the entire incident was a wake-up call for Estonia. To help secure themselves against future attacks, Estonia moved their government data to Microsoft's Azure cloud. And just as they had with connectivity, they invested big in cyber defense expertise. In the decades since this hack, Estonia's gotten really good at cyber defense. Because, according to Sarus Farivar, We now live in a world where nation states can have a real effect on people's lives somewhere else. Estonia was one of the first nations to be attacked this way. But what happened to them seems almost quaint in comparison to what we face regularly today. I mean, the worst case scenario that, you know, we worry about is that critical infrastructures are attacked and they're disabled. This is Scott Charney again. He's part of a team that heads up security policy for Microsoft. He says man-made disasters, like a hack, are like natural disasters, but have the potential to be even worse. With a hurricane, of course, you usually know it's coming and then it hits, but then it passes and everyone does restoration. In a cyber attack, it may never stop. You know, it may hit and things may go down. And as you're trying to bring it up, the adversary keeps trying to bring it down. It's like a storm that never ends. And, you know, if you think of a world without telecommunications, air transportation, that's a pretty bleak world. A cyber war is a man-made disaster. The question is, how do you come up with rules to govern it? How do you get all of the stakeholders to agree to what's off limits? ahead of time. Well, there's kind of a precedent for this. Here's Brad Smith, Microsoft's president and chief legal officer, speaking at a global security conference earlier this year. We need governments to take a page out of the 1949 Geneva Convention. What we need now is a digital Geneva Convention. A digital Geneva Convention. To understand what that is and how it would help, let's go back to the analog Geneva Convention. The time is 1949. The place, the Palace of Nations, Geneva, Switzerland. Here, 59 nations have met to create and set up an improved set of rules to provide a greater measure of protection for prisoners of war, wounded prisoners, non-combatant military personnel, and civilians not engaged in hostilities. Rules that have since been adopted by almost all nations of the world. What we call the Geneva Convention came out of a series of conferences, you know, like a convention. But when we use that term now, we're talking about a document that was ratified in 1949, at the end of World War II when the world's leaders got together to talk about what the rules of war should be. But the idea of defining the rules of war goes back much further, according to Professor Heidi Twarik, who writes about the history of media and technology. The first Geneva Convention was, was passed in 1864, and it governed how countries should treat wounded and sick soldiers in armed combat on land battlefields. Over the, the course of the late 19th and early 20th century, the Geneva Convention gets updated three times. Each of those updates was meant to address how non-combatants were treated during warfare. The rules changed as technology did, like when countries started using aircraft to attack each other. That warranted new rules to govern how to limit injury to civilians in a bombing. In its current incarnation, the Geneva Convention protects the wounded and sick military personnel on the battlefield and at sea, prisoners of war, and civilians during war times. When you think about the Geneva Convention, which follows the Blitz on London and the firebombing on Dresden, the world got together and said, if we're going to kill each other, Let's do it in a civilized way. This is Scott Charney again. You know, if you look at the history of the planet, there's a lot of war and soldiers often kill soldiers. People try to avoid it. But when it does erupt, let's try and protect civilian populations. In the olden days, you could protect civilians by not waging war in the places where they lived and worked. But now, where we live and work is the cloud. And just like the skies became a new place where fighting and spying could happen, cyberspace is a new battleground, 
wars will happen there. But to protect civilians, we need new rules. We need a new digital Geneva Convention. And there's a group of companies, including Microsoft, working to help protect Internet users. Here are some of the parameters they're working with right now. Number one, recognizing that the battlefield, as a discrete place that you can keep civilians out of, doesn't really exist on the Internet. Cyberspace is the playground, the school, the marketplace, the town hall, and the economy. And nations need to bear this in mind when they exchange volleys on the internet. Here's Scott Charney. The battlefield is designed, deployed, and maintained by the private sector. And the private sector is often the first responder when there's an attack. And so we are the battlefield. And that's fundamentally different than the way it used to work. Number two, a digital Geneva Convention must be a partnership between the nations that wage war and the private sector, because the private sector is made up of the companies that actually manage and protect the infrastructure where cyber war occurs. Both governments and private companies have a role to play by pointing out security flaws to one another when they find them so they can fix them rather than leaving them vulnerable to being exploited. You know, Microsoft has been involved in this debate for several years, and we are urging more companies to join because we really think it is critical to promoting trust in information technology. And finally, the third parameter they're working to establish, a digital Geneva Convention should be able to flex and change as easily as technology evolves. To that end, Microsoft is calling for the creation of a group or a forum to help identify the perpetrators of cyber attacks as the tactics change and get more sophisticated. Here's Microsoft President Brad Smith again from his speech at the Global Security Conference. We need an agency that brings together the best and the brightest in the private sector, the best and the brightest in academia and the public sector. We need an agency that has the international credibility not only to observe what's happening, but to identify the attackers when nation state attacks happen. The idea behind the forum is similar to the International Atomic Energy Agency. That's an independent organization that helps investigate whether or not a country has violated international rules, rather than relying on states to police themselves. A neutral third party could help navigate the stumbling blocks that this new battlefield presents, like figuring out where a cyber attack really originated. Here's Saruz Faravar again. If you're talking about missiles being launched from one place to another, you know, we have satellites and we have lots of other ways of saying, okay, yeah, this was launched from this base in this country. It's very easy to understand that. When it comes to, you know, who attacked who online or who did what, it's a little bit trickier. For example, going back to our Estonia case study, if one country had bombed another country, that would have been pretty clearly an act of war. But instead, the denial of service stunt, was it a hack or an attack? The answer has real-world ramifications. In Article 5 of the NATO Charter, uh, it famously says that an attack against one is an attack against all. Estonia is a member of NATO. The United States is a member of NATO. There are lots of other NATO countries in Europe. Um, and so what does that mean if, if Estonia or the U.S. is attacked online? Does that mean the other countries should gang up on Russia and attack Russian websites? When it comes to cyber warfare, nations have a choice about how they respond. But ignoring the issue isn't really an option anymore. For better or worse, we're all in this together, according to Scott Charney. And you think about the internet, you can think about global warming, which you just can't solve one country at a time because we're all connected. We all share the same planet and the same environment. We all share the same internet, and we're all dependent in large part on the same set of technologies. One set of rules in a digital Geneva Convention is a place to start. It's a way of getting countries and private companies around the table to begin these conversations. We've never done that before. Now's the time to try. But in case you're sitting there thinking, man, this seems like it's totally out of my hands, our historian and media expert from earlier, Heidi Twarik, has some news for you. You see a lot of people who say, oh, there's nothing we can do. We just have to take it. And, and that just seems to me really a fallacious way of, of going about things. Can we prevent massive cyber attacks? I really hope so. But let's not just pretend that there's nothing we can do about it. 
Like for starters, follow the instructions. Everybody has done that where it pops up on your screen and it says update and you always want to click on the button not now because you know how annoying it's going to be. But if you're a hospital, you can't click on the not now button. This is one of the things that went wrong with this spring's WannaCry ransomware attack. Computers at the National Health Service in England were locked by the attack and held hostage for ransom. The computers were vulnerable because they hadn't been updated in ages. But even if you're not a hospital, do the upgrade. They're actually about making sure that our computers are not vulnerable and that our critical infrastructure is up to scratch and not subject to these sorts of vulnerabilities as far as we can ensure that. Heidi says upgrading might very well be more than just a good idea. We should actually consider whether companies should be legally obligated to do updates on critical infrastructure, in the same way citizens are legally obligated to take certain precautions. For example, It's the responsibility of every citizen within the United States to get themselves vaccinated against diseases like measles because then that ensures that we don't end up having epidemics. But if an epidemic does break out, we do have the World Health Organization and we have the CDC to deal with it. So we have multiple stakeholders in trying to prevent epidemics and to contain health scares. Individuals who use computers are also responsible. They're not solely responsible, but they play a role just as it is our role as a citizen to ensure that our children are vaccinated. Everyone has a role to play. As citizens, it's keeping our defenses up to date. And as members of the global community, as nations, our role is to engage with each other to keep our clouds safe. A new digital Geneva Convention might seem high in the sky. Get it? The cloud, high in the sky? But it's also important because we all play a part in keeping one another safe online because we're all connected on the cloud. Dot Future is a co-production of Microsoft Story Labs and Gimlet Creative. We were produced this week by Anna Adlerstein and Caitlin Boguki, with help from Victoria Barner, Garrett Crow, Francis Harlow, Nicole Wong, Abby Ruzica, Julia Botero, and Jorge Estrada. Creative direction from Nazanin Rafsanjani. Production assistance from Tom Cody. We were edited by Rachel Ward and mixed by Zach Schmidt. Our theme song was composed by The Album Leaf. Additional music from Elliot Lip, Walvo, and Marmoset. Special thanks to Tom Dannenbaum, Nikki Clark, Matthew Dermot Clancy, and Eve Sandoval from the International Committee of the Red Cross. Coming up next week on Dot Future, we're tackling the issue of health. In the digital era, we have access to so much data. Because I keep track of a lot of sets of data about myself, what's your heart rate, what's your respiration, what's your blood sugar, it's very easy for me to understand where behaviors are coming from and how to adjust them. How we turn data into meaningful information to keep ourselves well. That's coming up next week on Dot Future. If you like Dot Future, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And please leave us a review to tell us why. It really helps people find our show. To learn more about the show, visit dotfuture.net. I'm Christina Quinn. Thanks so much for listening.